I am not in an achievement hunter, or trophy hunter as it were. However, I have a bit of a policy. If a game really grabs me, I mean to the point where I think it's basically perfect, I will go out of my way to get the platinum trophy. For me, it's a very small sign of respect to the developers. It's me saying, you have made a great game that I adore, and, as such, I will do my best to see every last ounce of content that you have put here. And, as of this week, I have completed a much sought after goal. I have acquired the Platinum Trophy for every Souls game, including Bloodborne. Now, am I here to brag? Yes. But beyond that, I've learned a couple of things over the course of playing all these games to absolute completion that I had never really picked up on or appreciated before. So that's what we're going to talk about today. These are largely stray thoughts that I had over the course of my journey that I don't really think have enough meat to carry their own video, but in aggregate, are decently interesting. Also, a quick side note for those of you interested, I have a copy of each build I use to platinum each game in the description. But also remember that I never use a shield because I hate them, so if you're someone who uses that as a crutch, might not be useful. Anyways, let's start with... I was never big into Souls PvP. I wouldn't avoid it if I got invaded and would occasionally hang out in Ulysseel, but I wasn't one of those people who sat around crafting build after build in order to kill every Giant's Dad cosplayer on the planet. However, in my pursuit to get these trophies, I had to do more than little PvP in order to get all of the spells, miracles, pyromancies, and eventually rings locked behind the covenants that I needed. I could have just grinded the necessary items from mob drops, but I wanted to, you know, have fun. Initially, I was doing... not good. Even discounting parries, I was regularly getting stomped. However, I had a small breakthrough after a specific duel. I was in it with this guy who was using a large sword. When I'd approach, he'd swing, but not in a way that felt like it was meant to hit me. He'd just throw it out to keep me away so he could approach on his terms. That's when it clicked with me. He was zoning me out, and his build was designed from the ground up to reward that kind of play. From there, the parallels began to fall into place. The value of hit confirms and hit stun, the existence of hyper armor on certain moves, a wake up game, and even a tier list and taunts. Upon realizing this, I began to gradually shift my focus in how I played from a Diablo and WoW mindset to a more Soul Calibur esque one. And sure enough, I began to immediately see marked improvements. Now, after having played around 50 hours of PvP spread over 5 games, I feel really comfortable in saying that if you wanted to get really good at Dark Souls PvP, then perhaps the best thing you could do is read Gutex's fighting game fundamentals and play a little bit of Ryu. Look, I love Dark Souls 1 with all of my heart. I think it's basically perfect. But if there's a serious bone I have to pick with it, especially in a meta sense, it's that it retroactively changed the legacy of Demon Souls. It changed Demon Souls from an inventive 7th gen cult classic that brought a lot of fresh and new ideas to the table, to that game that came out before Dark Souls. And I get it, everything Demon Souls did, Dark Souls did better. Or at least, that's what I thought before I really dove into Demon Souls. But having now seen every ounce of content in both games, there's one massive thing that makes it stand out from Dark Souls. It has hope. There's always this looming sense in Dark Souls that even if you were to succeed, it's still largely pointless. This won't immediately benefit most of the characters you've come to care about, especially since most of them are dead or undead by the time you finish. And one day, no matter what, the flame will fade. The kingdom is completely in ruins, most of the normal people have gone hollow, and the gods will not be returning to this land. By the end, you even learn that for you to help, you have to essentially sacrifice yourself. No one walks away from this all that much better. You can try to help, but you are, at best, delaying the inevitable. Meanwhile, there's demon souls. Here things are bad but not beyond repair. Many of your enemies are humans that have been corrupted or possessed by the Old One's influence, but are not demons themselves. The only thing keeping most of the characters from just getting on with their lives is the fact that Baltaria is crawling with demons. And it's hinted that there are lands beyond Baltaria that have yet to be affected by this mess, but they will be if no one stops it here, and that's where you come in. 
If you can just lull the old one back to sleep, you might be able to fix everything. You have hope that this will help. In other words, Demon Souls is the only optimistic Souls game, and that, above all else, makes it a fascinating game to examine. There's also a bunch of little mechanical differences that make Demon Souls pretty cool in its own right as well. Actual garbage. You could make the case that any number of bosses from this series are the best. And you would also be right, but for my money, after having fought every single boss in the franchise at least three times on at least two New Game Plus cycles, the one I look back on the most fondly is Lady Maria. As I said last week, I am a sucker for a rival, and while the Soul series has lacked rivals that hound and taunt you in the way more classical ones do, all of them have rivals who you develop relationships with in a more emergent way. Typically, these relationships are developed by hearing little snippets of info about each boss before fighting them, going in to fight them, discovering that they have roughly the same skill set and size as you, getting stomped on, and rinsing and repeating over and over again. And every game has at least one fight that follows this structure. Demon Souls has Garl Vinlin or King Elant, Dark Souls has Artorius and Gwyn, Dark Souls 2 had Sir Elan, and Dark Souls 3 has the final boss who I won't spoil here because the game is still fairly new. Bloodborne, however? loves these encounters. Out of the 22 bosses, not counting the filler chalice dungeon bosses, five of the bosses follow this pattern, debatably six if you want to count Ludwig. A big part of this is because of Bloodborne's greater focus on characters, but it reflects a stronger interest in making the player understand and care about who, what, and why they're fighting more than other Souls games. To understand why fighting Artorias is tragic, you need to commit to reading a ton of item descriptions, hunting down Ingward, and potentially even picking up on environmental clues. Fighting Lady Maria, however, comes with immediacy. You approach to fight her, she grabs your arm and oh my god is that the doll? A mirror to your one unambiguous ally and all of this is now standing here in front of you. It is instantly personal. From there she proceeds to offer the most fast paced fight you've had up until that point where she tests you on everything you've learned. And it's great. For me, no character better sums up how to craft a souls rival better than Lady Maria. In order for a Souls game to be a true Souls game, in both name and quality, every aspect of it has to feed into each other. The lore has to support the style of combat, the style of combat has to reflect the strength of the enemies in the lore, the strength of the enemies has to be reflected in their design, that design should be reflected in the world at large, and the world at large should be crafted by the lore. More than perhaps any other style of game, Ludo narrative dissonance has no place here. This is part of why I think the initial release of Dark Souls 2 left so many, myself included, cold. Something like Hyde's Tower of Flame being out of place compared to the distance you have to walk or the Shrine of Winters requiring you to kill four demigods in order to pass a pile of rubble wouldn't be all that questionable in a game like Final Fantasy. You might notice them and laugh about them in the same way we all laugh about the eagles in The Lord of the Rings, but you'd move past it. But Souls games need to feel real and coherent. To put it in Tolkien terms, while most games require suspension of disbelief, Souls games demand secondary belief, i.e. your belief that the world is, to some degree, real and dictated by laws in history. Even the slightest crack in this veneer can result in the whole work collapsing in on itself. If the level design doesn't fit the art direction, then the art direction doesn't reflect the lore. So then the lore doesn't fit as well in the core gameplay, so the core gameplay begins to feel emptier. And if the core gameplay feels empty, what's the point? I believe it's for this reason that Dark Souls has proven so difficult to clone, with only one game outside of FromSoft really nailing what makes the genre so good. But it's that same tightrope walk that makes these games so admirable and memorable in the first place. I have nothing to add to this. See you guys later.